All right. Hi, everyone. I hope you're having a lovely day. It's gorgeous outside, so hopefully you're getting out to enjoy the sunshine sometime today. Um, thanks for taking the time to join us for um, our webinar number three of 2016 for the CHA Antimicrobial Stewardship Collaborative. Uh, today's webinar is going to be on debunking common myths. A couple of housekeeping items. As always, um, please do not put us on hold. We will hear your hold music. If you guys have any background noise or anticipate any background noise, um, please look down at your phone right now and either press the mute button or press star six um, because we don't want to hear that background noise. It is incredibly distracting. Um, so if we do hear background noise during the presentation, um, I will be giving you guys a gentle reminder, um, but please make sure to do that now. If you do need to unmute for any reason to ask a question, um, you can press pound six if you've pressed star six to mute. Um, we are going to be taking some questions throughout the webinar today, um, but we may have to kind of cut you off because we do have a lot to cover. Um, so then if you have any additional questions, please hold them till the end of the webinar. I have um, one huge reminder that I want to give out um, before we get started, and that is to register for the May 6th, the Friday, May 6th, in-person one-year celebration. Um, we have a fantastic agenda for you guys, um, as, as, as is seen up here on the screen. Um, we do have a couple changes. Steven Summer, our CEO, will not be joining us, but Janet McIntyre, our VP of Professional Services, will be there. We'll have Arjun Srinivasan, um, a wonderful panel of um, folks from the hospitals that are participating in the collaborative. Um, Libby Dodds-Ashley, um, a pharmacist, is going to be joining us. Wendy Bamberg from CDPHE. And then Ethan Cumbler, a doctor from the University of Colorado Hospital, um, will be talking about change management in a presentation called Emergence. So if you guys do not have that um, registration link, please let me know. I'll get it to you. Um, but do make sure you register or anyone else in your um, facility who's going to be joining us, make sure they register too so we can get an accurate count for food. Um, and I do want to thank you guys all for your amazing work to get your data in from quarter four of 2015. We really appreciate it. Um, Brian, our statistician, is currently working on getting reports together. Um, so I know that was not um, an easy lift for you guys. It's always um, a lot of work on your end. So we really do appreciate the work that you're doing to get that data in. Um, and it'll really pay off in the end. So a couple notes before we get started with our myths. Um, I'll hand it over to Terry. Terry's going to read each myth, and then the steering committee member who um, helped debunk that myth or give an expert response will chime in. Um, we only have about three to four minutes per myth, so we're going to have to move through a little quickly. Um, so we may have time for one or two comments or questions after each myth. Um, and again, if we can't get to your questions um, right away, we'll hold them till the end. So I will hand it over to Terry now. And we did group the, um, with Heidi's help, um, did group the, the myths into um, a couple groupings. So the first one is antibiotics um, for C. diff. Antibiotics and C. diff. OK. So myth number one, use of vancomycin instead of metronidazole on a mild to moderate first recurrence of C. diff infection. Heidi? Or Tim is, is our... So it is true that metronidazole is the recommended drug of choice for an initial episode of, of mild to moderate C. diff infection. That's per the SHEA and IDSA guideline from 2010. And then the guideline goes on to say that treatment of the first recurrence is usually with the same regimen as the initial episode that should be stratified by disease severity. Um, so, if a patient has a recurrence with a mild to moderate um, C. diff infection, then the current guidance would actually support using metronidazole again to treat that infection. However, if a patient has a recurrent infection and it then meets criteria for severe C. diff, and that's based on things like older age, high white count, uh, changes in renal function, then vancomycin would be recommended in that scenario. Next slide. But as a caveat to this, so there is a new um, or updated Shea and IDSA guideline for C. diff that's coming out. 
uh, and that's actually been slated to be released this spring. So we may be seeing this new guideline uh, any time. And I've been told by a colleague who's had some involvement in the guideline that vancomycin actually might be recommended for not only all recurrences, but all cases of C. diff in general. Metronidazole may no longer be recommended as a first-line agent for C. diff. Now, this is hearsay, so I don't want to, uh, you know, we, don't, we shouldn't go changing our practice uh, at this point based on that, but I think the point is um, stay tuned here because th there may be some changes to management practices coming down the pipe uh, with, with respect to management of mild to moderate C. diff infection and recurrences. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll keep going. So the next category is general antibiotics. Um, myth number one here is, if empiric therapy is working, don't change anything. This is Heidi. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the... You know, I think the, the issue here is of collateral damage, right? Um, that, uh, and, and, you know, you want to be using uh, the narrow spectrum uh, antibiotic that will get the job done safely for the patient, um, and also um, risk of adverse drug events. And so, um, you know, the CDC recommends this idea of a time out when the culture results come back. And I think, um, you know, it just, I think people know this, it's just the path of least resistance not to change anything, uh, but ultimately you need to stop and pause when um, uh, you get the culture results back and determine, you know, if you can use a more uh, focused antimic antimicrobial uh, to get the job done. Um, and also if you are, you know, determine at that point what the duration of therapy needs to be um, and stick to it. Um, if the, especially because usually at 48 hours um, or 72 hours, you, you have a sense of what the patient's clinical response has been. So anyway, um, but I, I think the idea of a timeout is kind of an easy tool with which to accomplish this um, for folks. Sounds good. Does anybody have any questions for Heidi? No. Okay, we'll keep going. Myth number two, that everyone needs antibiotics always. We've all heard that. <laughs> Heidi, that's another one for you. Right, and, and, and you know, everybody knows I'm a geriatrician, I'm not an ID specialist, but these are kind of you know, common sense, and clearly whoever brought this myth in is probably somewhat, you know, tongue-in-cheek and frustrated um, with the way we culturally have come to view antibiotics as basically having, you know, fixing everything and not harming anyone. Um, and so I think <laughs> the obvious um, answer to this is that, you know, antibiotics are medications that have, you know, uh, a a real and finite amount of risk with them, just like any, any medication. Um, and uh, those can be adverse drug events, they can be drug allergies, they can be uh, seeded to seal, et cetera. Um, and, and further, um, antibiotic use, again, you know, the collateral damage resistance um, in, the, in the community. So it's just a lose, lose, lose um, to just use antibiotics, just put them, you know, essentially put them in the water. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and it's a culture shift, um, but um, the, you know, that's, that's what we're doing here with this project. Um, so anyway, I don't know if Tim or anyone else has anything else to chime in. No, I, I agree with what you said. I... Any questions from anybody else or comments? Heidi, the weekend, Heidi? Yeah. This is Jerry. How are you? Good. The weekend's coming. Can you write me a prescription for a Z pack, please? <laughs> no, I have to tell you, my mother does this every time my parents come to visit. 
The father's having a cough. Can you put him on antibiotics? So we, you know, we all deal with this in all realms of our life. <laughs> Yeah, and I would, I would add to that that I think we're, we're learning more and more about some of these previously unknown um, unintended consequences of antibiotics. And, and one of those, which I think we probably need to be discussing more with our patients, is the impact on the microbiome. Um, so, so this really uh, appears to have potential long-term consequences in terms of um, promoting potentially chronic health uh, diseases um, by altering your um, your gastrointestinal microbiome in children who are exposed to antibiotics. There's an association with early childhood obesity. Um, so, so I think there are still a lot of unknowns in addition to the knowns about unintended consequences of uh, antibiotics. And I think the microbiome is one of these sort of hot topics that we're hearing more about. That I think we can really start to harness that and begin to discuss that with patients. Uh, as a means to help um, convey to them that uh, prescribing antibiotic may not be the best thing to do because of that potential um, unintended consequence. That's huge. And that is um, one thing that CHA is currently working on, too, for you guys. Um, we're hoping to finalize it here pretty soon. We're working on some patient and family materials. Um, we know the CDC has some, um, but we did have some requests for um, some specific ones for the collaborative. Um, so hopefully we'll be getting something out that might be able to help with that patient education. Any more comments on this one? Okay, myth number three for the general category. Using ertapenem or ceftriaxone for surgical prophylaxis is beneficial because these agents with their long half-lives pro provides a sustained duration of action. And this is one that Jerry Barber is going to speak to. Okay, um, yeah, there are uh, a number of times we've encountered surgeons with this. And it's yeah, partly brought on because of the, the relatively broader spectrum of ceftriaxone and the very wide spectrum of ertapenem, but then um, with pharmacists sometimes, you know, gently challenging them, it, it also comes out to the fact that they begin to go into uh, pharmacokinetic characteristics of the drug and talk about its long duration of activity, that I can just use this preoperatively and, and get by, which often is also uh, seldom the case where they don't ask for postoperative dosing as well. But the fact is, is that using these longer uh, acting agents with, with long duration gives them a, a very false sense of security because especially when going into longer duration surgery, in general, when you begin to get to three hours or longer, there are larger losses of blood associated with those procedures, more manipulations. And so in essence, what happens is, uh, first off, is that the, uh, the blood is suctioned out, and so the antibiotic winds up in a vacutainer at the foot of the operating room um, um, level. And then on top of that, to keep the patient hemodynamically stable, other fluids are, are often administered which further diminish the concentrations of the antibiotic in either the bloodstream or at the tissue site. Any questions for Jerry or comments? Okay, we'll move on. Now we get into the skin and soft tissue infection myths. Um, myth number one, addition of clindamycin to vancomycin or beta-lactam improves outcomes in severe skin and soft tissue infections. Um, this is one that Tim will try and debunk. I'd say that this actually um, could be partially true for very severe skin infections, and in particular necrotizing soft tissue infections. Um, but for the vast majority of cases of skin infections that we see in the hospital, so typical cases of cellulitis and abscess, there's really um, a lack of high quality data uh, that would support giving clindamycin in addition to either vancomycin 
or beta lactam. And so for most of our cases of cellulitis and abscess that we'll be seeing, uh, the national IDSA treatment guidelines for skin and soft tissue infections recommend single agent therapy uh, with a beta lactam or potentially clindamycin by itself, but not combination therapy. Um, but it is pretty well, I would say, a community standard that if somebody suspects a necrotizing soft tissue infection, to go ahead and add clindamycin um, to your, your standard treatment. And that's because clindamycin can have a couple potential benefits in that setting. That one is shutting off toxin production, which is what uh, leads to the necrotizing component uh, of the infection. And clindamycin can also be more effective at very high inoculums of bacteria in contrast to beta lactams that rely on uh, cell wall turnover and dividing organisms. And dividing organisms or organisms don't divide uh, rapidly uh, in high inoculum infections when they've reached the stationary growth phase. So there is certainly rationale um, for this. Um, next slide. Okay. And this is, this is the current algorithm for managing cellulitis in the IDSA guideline. You can see on the right that for mild cases, these would be your outpatient cases, an oral beta-lactam or clindamycin by itself would be recommended. For our moderate severity cases, so this would be the typical case you would see in the hospital of somebody with cellulitis, uh, again, an IV beta-lactam or clindamycin by itself. And then there's this third component of severe infection, and this is where you suspect a necrotizing process. So when that's the case, you're uh, first off ruling out a necrotizing infection by uh, consulting surgery and getting either a bedside or an operative um, biopsy to uh, evaluate for that. And you can see here that even in this case, the empiric recommendation is for vancomycin plus piperacil and tazobactam. So they even in this particular setting don't recommend uh, the addition of clindamycin. Next slide. But where they do specifically recommend the addition of clindamycin is for confirmed or documented group A streptococcal necrotizing fasciitis. Uh, and as you can see here, that's a strong recommendation, but based on low quality evidence. So the evidence for um, clindamycin and necrotizing infections is from the late 70s and early 80s, and there's actually very little clinical data uh, to support it. Much of it was in peas. But I think the bottom line is if somebody, if a provider does suspect or certainly if they have confirmed necrotizing fasciitis or necrotizing soft tissue infections, there really is probably reasonable to use adjunctive clindamycin. Uh, but in all other cases, and that's the vast majority of cases that we see in the hospital, it's not recommended to add clindamycin uh, to either vancomycin or the beta lactam. Next slide. And I just wanted to point out this uh, study, and I, we talked about this study at the last webinar that I gave in, um, I believe, in February. Uh, but this is a study that I think are maybe driving some providers to do this practice of adding clindamycin to, uh, to vancomycin. Um, so in this study, they, the authors um, claimed that adding clindamycin to vancomycin uh, improved clinical outcomes compared with vancomycin alone. But there are some really important take-home points regarding this trial. So first of all, it was just a single center uh, and a retrospective cohort study. Uh, and there were significant differences between the groups. So in the vancomycin plus clindamycin group, there were significantly fewer diabetics, the patients were younger, in general, fewer comorbidities uh, and uh, even a lower severity of illness. So it's really not unexpected that that group may have had better outcomes. So there's some clear selection bias going on uh, in this study. And then lastly, the outcomes that they used were really fairly interesting and they may have been um, influenced by factors other than clindamycin exposure. So one of the outcomes they reported on were 90-day readmission rates for any infection not even skin and soft tissue infection. So it's really hard for me to believe that adding clindamycin could uh, impact the patient's risk for hospitalization 80 days later uh, 
great. Any questions or comments? Okay, on we go. Myth number... Hey, Kim, sorry. That's okay. I have a question. This is Ree. Hi, Ree. Go ahead. Um, so for the eagle, in fact, with the high inoculum, is, um, do we have certain types of patients that we need to be concerned about that? Is it the size of the infection or other factors? And that will make us concerned about the eagle effect. Yeah, again, that's really hard to know, and that's something that's really largely been demonstrated in, in in vitro and animal models. So once again, we have little little clinical data, but I really think that that gets to the um, um, into the realm of necrotizing infections where you have a massive, overwhelming uh, infection. So it turns out that a typical case of cellulitis is actually a very low burden of organism disease. So when we've tried to culture these cases by doing aspirates or biopsies at the leading edge of cellulitis, you only find a pathogen in about a third of cases, um, which speaks to the fact that there are not a lot of organisms. So these are highly inflammatory diseases, so clearly the skin gets red, tender, uh, very warm, but that's more inflammation than it is a burden of organisms. So I think the eagle effect is really not relevant in um, uh, in the typical case of cellulitis or particularly a drained access uh, that we see. But, but a good question. Thank you. And I would also add that if if your hospitals, if providers in your hospitals are adding clindamycin, um, there's still an opportunity to reduce antibiotic use by getting them to peel that off quickly. So as soon as there's no if there's no concern for a necrotizing infection, and that should be confirmed within the first 24 hours, uh, I think if somebody has added clindamycin, the vancomycin or beta-lactam, getting them to think about discontinuing that even at 24 hours uh, is an opportunity to reduce antibiotic use. That sounds great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Okay, on to myth number two for skin and soft tissue infections. Diabetic patients with cellulitis need broad-spectrum antibiotic coverage. Yeah, so this, I think, is actually a fairly common myth. Uh, and and I, I think it probably stems from the fact that patients who have diabetic foot infections or infected diabetic ulcers can have polymicrobial infections. But for diabetics who have a typical cellulitis or a typical abscess that's not a diabetic foot infection or an infected ulcer, the IDSA guideline doesn't recommend any, doesn't recommend any different antibiotic coverage than they would for a non-diabetic. Uh, and in particular, there's no recommendation to include broad gram-negative antibiotic therapy, uh, which is um, commonly added. Uh, and I would add that even for patients who have infected diabetic ulcers or diabetic foot infections, the current IDSA guidelines for those particular infections for a mild to moderate infection still support vancomycin alone. They don't recommend adding, they don't recommend adding gram negative coverage or broader spectrum therapy uh, until, um, or uh, unless it's a severe uh, infection. So, so even for mild to moderate diabetic foot infections, we can start with vancomycin alone. That is actually part of our protocol here at Denver Health. And so in general for these patients with non-diabetic foot infections, with just your typical cellulitis or abscess, um, the, the limited microbiological evidence we have really doesn't support the need for broader spectrum therapy. Uh, and we have some of that on the next slide. So, so this was a study um, from seven hospitals in Colorado, community and academic facilities, where we had identified 707 patients who had either cellulitis or an abscess. And almost a quarter of those were diabetic, uh, and the rest were obviously non-diabetic. And we looked at the differences in microbiology and antibiotic treatment uh, among those two groups. And not surprisingly, we, we found that the vast majority of both diabetics and non-diabetics had gram-positive organisms 
when an, organism, when an organism was identified. So in most cases, an organism was not actually uh, identified. Uh, and gram-negative pathogens were identified actually slightly less often in diabetics than non-diabetics. So again, certainly does not support the need that, uh, or the, does not support the practice that diabetics would need broader spectrum therapy than non-diabetics. But what we found in terms of the practices were that the diabetics were actually more likely, significantly more likely to get exposed to this, uh, with broad gram-negative uh, antibiotics. This speaks to that myth and that providers feel like diabetics are at higher risk for gram-negative pathogens. They're more likely to, pres because they're more likely to prescribe broad gram-negative antibiotics. But the best evidence we have at this point and our national guidelines really don't support the need to use broader spectrum therapy uh, compared with non-diabetics. Any questions for Tim? Okay, thanks Tim. On to urinary tract infection questions or myths. Myth number one, fluoroquinolones are more effective than cephalosporins in outpatient treatment of pyelonephritis and cephalosporins are less effective in the treatment of UTIs. Um, this will either for Heidi or Tim, it looks like. Let's see next slide. Okay. I can't remember who. Heidi or Tim, I can't yeah. remember which one of you guys uh, chimed in on this one. I think we did it together. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'll, I'll just summarize. Um, so, uh, there is some uh, data that in outpatient UTI, um, oral cephalosporins are inferior to other UTI drugs to achieve cure. Um, and I uh, think the scenario in which we're operating, uh, in which we're um, recommending cephalosporin is a little bit different, and so we're um, uh, suggesting that um, the data from that work can't really be generalized um, to the inpatient setting, uh, where most patients are getting um, IV cephalosporin uh, prior uh, to discharge. Um, it, this has come up a number of times, though, um, because oral cephalosporin um, is on our algorithm. Um, and so we um, are proposing to put together a resource for the group um, uh, to address this particular fish, uh, issue in the, in the um, form of a uh, frequently asked question sheet uh, with references um, attached. Um, Tim, was there a, additional information you wanted to provide there? No, I think, I think that's a good summary. I'll just give one example of, of what's out there in the literature. So a, a couple of years ago uh, in JAMA, there was a study of uh, a three-day course of Cipro uh, compared with a three-day course of cephodoxine, a third-generation oral cephalosporin for uncomplicated cystitis. Uh, and the cure rates for uh, with Cipro were slightly higher on the order of 90% to 80%, so about a 10% absolute difference. So it's not that the oral cephalosporins are, are horrible, horrible drugs, uh, it's just they may, that they statistically uh, are probably inferior. Uh, but again, uh, a three-day treatment um, in outpatient cystitis is, is quite different than the, um, than the patient who's getting uh, several days of IV ceftriaxone up front. And because we know that one of the issues with the oral cephalosporins is they don't have great oral bio bioavailability. Um, but that's um, circumvented when we're giving these drugs uh, intravenously in the hospital setting. Um, but, I, but I think the concern is legitimate, and I think there are some that think that there should be longer courses of, of oral cephalosporin therapy in patients who are being treated for pylo. Um, our particular recommendation at Denver Health, if you're transitioning to an oral cephalosporin, is to do 10 days. And I recognize that our guideline says five to seven days. Um, and so I think there may be um, some 
potential discomfort with that short of a course. Um, but the, I think the bottom line is we don't have the data to give a firm recommendation. But I'd be interested to hear from people on the line. Are there people that are getting pushback or concerns from their providers about uh, using oral cephalosporins for, for PILA? Uh, here at University, we're not getting a lot of pushback for using oral cephalosporins. The only really issue we typically run into is sometimes the cost of like the third gen steps for outpatient therapy. And they might not be covered as well. We tend to use uh, Keplex quite quite frequently if we have susceptibility um, for kind of step down therapy. Uh huh. Just make sure we keep the long duration. Yeah, the ten days is what we do here too. Yeah. For pilot, yeah. With a sample story. And I think overall there's less clinical experience, and there are fewer studies with first generation cephalosporins um, with Keplex for UTIs. But uh, but I think I mean a lot of clinical experience it seems to work, and so I think a lot of institutions, or some institutions certainly do do use that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, on we go. Um, myth number two, nitrofurantoin is a terrible drug to use in the elderly. Um, it looks like either Mark Meyer or Heidi. We're going to comment on this. Is Mark on the line? Is Mark going to pop in? Uh, I'm on the line, but go ahead and I'll just add stuff. All right, good. Okay, so um, if Terry, if you could advance to the next slide. So, uh, you know, there are a number of um, uh, concerns about nitrofurantoin, and for that reason, it had. Um, uh, fallen out of use in the elderly, um, and uh, we'd like to address a couple of those concerns. And and Mark um, has been kind of combing the literature recently for this, um, uh, for the evidence to support this. So um, one, you know, number one is the side effect pro profile. So um, the uh, side effects include pulmonary toxicity, hepatotoxicity, and peripheral neuropathy. Um, and, you know, I think those side effects generally were reported in patients who in, you know, prior eras were prescribed nitro in chronically for UTI suppression. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about, you know, five to seven day courses of antibiotic uh, for cystitis um, where, you know, the um, potential for a major serious side effect is quite limited. We're not talking about um, using this medication for um, chronic therapy. Um, the second major point is about um, efficacy, both uh, with regard um, to site, <laughs> where, where, how, uh, where the drug um, is effective and how, uh, if you can get levels there, right? So it has to be uh, filtered to reach the bladder um, to have uh, effect. Um, so number one, nitrofurantoin is a recommendation only for cystitis, um, not for upper urinary tract infection or, or, or bacteremic infection. Uh, number two um, is, regard, is regard, in regard to renal function. And what's so interesting is that the typical cutoff that you see for renal function um, to, to get the right level of nitrofurantoin in the bladder is a GFR of greater than 60 milligrams per deciliter. So that's what Mark was found in literature, um, and we found papers that essentially supported um, that there's they couldn't find, reviewers doing systematic reviews of the literature couldn't find data that supported this cutoff. It's unclear how it um, arrived in the literature. Um, uh, the only data that we could find was the GFR of greater than 40 being adequate for the use of this uh, medication. Um, interestingly, the Beers criterion, which is that um, kind of expert opinion list of meds to avoid in the elderly 
um, used to list it as, um, a, you know, particularly like basically avoid at all costs in the elderly. Um, but the Spears criterion is on its third or fourth revision, and the most recent 2015 update of the Beers criterion actually modified, they actually list a GFR of greater than 30. Um, so, um, you know, we think in the right circumstance, given, um, you know, the um, problems with many of the other first-line therapies that nitrofurantoin is reasonable for short course for cystitis in a patient with adequate renal function um, down to the level of the GFR of 30 to 40. Mark, what do you think? Uh, the only thing I would add is I think the, to look at the original literature on this was from the late 1950s, and they actually altered this uh, dosing based on about 10 cases. So there was not a lot of good, and it just kind of stuck. Uh, and, and if anybody wants those papers, I can certainly send them to them. But I know for our nursing home project that we're doing across the southern part of the state with about 500 beds, if you looked at the antibiograms, which is, uh, and most of their uh, UTIs are E. coli, and across the board at these um, facilities, the antibiograms showed 97% sensitivity to nitrofurantoin. So Heidi and I did end up recommending that as a first-line drug um, for them to treat. Uh, simple cystitis in these uh, geriatric patients. I do think there's some cloud in the literature as to whether to use this on males or not. I think uh, you can safely say five to seven days for a female, it's, it's good, good. I'm not so sure we can really find the literature to say that you can do that with a male patient. So, I think that's all I have to add. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Well, as, as our guideline says, males aren't simple, so um, their uh, urinary tract apparatus is more complicated, and it doesn't always uh, filter and penetrate uh, as well, especially in the prostate area, as some of these other antibodies. Any more questions? Feedback? Okay, thank you. Myth number three, bacteremia in UTI always needs prolonged or IV antibiotics even with early clinical response. Um, Heidi, I'll let you speak to this one. Sure. It, you know, Tim and I um, discussed this myth. So, um, you know, the, the bottom line is that, um, you know, gram-negative bacteremia associated with UTI is generally transient and generally doesn't um, kind of uh, set up endovascular infection, hematogenous spread to other sites, abscesses, et cetera, in the way that a gram-positive um, might, like a staph. Um, and um, so in general, um, bacteremic patients um, don't necessarily need a prolonged IV antibiotics. Um, there is data that is supportive of this. Um, I have reference here study from The Lancet in 2012. This was a study of short course therapy using Cipro for pyelonephritis. Um, in this um, study, uh, this, there were, uh, and these I think were actually primarily outpatients, but there were a significant um, percentage of the patients were bacteremic, um, and there was no suggestion um, that there was any problem with the short course of ciprotherapy in that subgroup that was studied. Um, so, um, the, you know, the, the answer is, you know, gram negative bacteremia associated with UTI um, is uh, different from uh, other uh, bacteremia, particularly staph, um, and does not require prolonged IV antibiotics. I'd say this is somewhat analogous to pneumococcal bacteremia in the setting of pneumococcal pneumonia. So there have been a number of studies that have suggested that um, the presence of pneumococcal bacteremia in pneumococcal pneumonia does not uh, lead to worsened clinical outcomes compared with non-bacteremic uh, patients. So we actually um, don't recommend any alteration of therapy. We don't extend the duration of therapy uh, in patients who have um, transient pneumococcal bacteremia 
Eso es el de Maunia. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Thank you, guys. On to myth number four. UTI in males needs treatment for prostatitis, i.e. up to four weeks of treatment. Hey, we're putting... Yeah, I mean, this, this is Heidi. This touches a little bit on kind of Mark's question about, um, you know, uh, the male GU tract. <laughs> but the, um, you know, prostatitis is a, you know, distinct clinical entity. Um, so a little bit different um, from cystitis. Um, and, you know, the really, um, you need to kind of identify which, what clinical entity you're treating. Um, and so, um, the, you know, if there's a question, I think you need to do a prostate exam um, and determine, you know, if, if this is clinically prostatitis. Um, but a, in a male who has, a, you know, who you believe has cystitis, um, who has an adequate clinical response, um, the, our recommendation um, is, um, you know, the same as it is um, in uh, in terms of duration of therapy um, for as it is for women. Any more? Any comments or any input? Okay. Thank you. Myth number five, cephalosporins are less effective in the treatment of UTIs. It looks like, Tim, was this one that you were going to respond to? It looks like it's duplicated from the prior, uh, from a prior one. Okay, so go on. Our mistake. We'll move on. Okay, we'll get in. Sorry, Heidi. We'll get into the general um, questions. All cultures need to be acted upon. I, I, I wrote this response, but I'd love, you know, any of the other experts to chime in. But, you know, my um, under, you know, the way I approach it is that a culture, like anything else, has to be interpreted within the clinical context. Right, and we know that colonization is common in certain organ systems. Um, right, I think about the upper respiratory tract, the GI tract, um, elderly urinary tract, and obviously the skin. Right, and so um, you know, and in addition, not all cultures um, are. You know, some cultures get contaminated in the collection process. So I think you know, it is impossible to interpret a culture. Um, in, outside of the clinical context. I, I put a you know, special note about asymptomatic bacteria, as of course is my favorite topic, but um, you know, it is super common in certain populations, and I just listed them, the chronically catheterized, the nursing home resident, the in, and even the community dwelling elderly. Um, and so um, it is very hard to interpret a positive culture um, um, in some of these populations. Um, so the bottom line is, um, you know, it, you, a culture out of context is not helpful. I think that seems to be one of the biggest myths in all of the work that we've done, even outside of this antimicrobial stewardship project, to get people to understand is the clinical context of cultures. Any other comments or feedback, input? Okay. Skin and soft tissue infection diagnosis. Um, cellulitis is commonly bilateral. Yeah, this is Tim. So there's really not a lot of data uh, to, to debunk this myth, but, but I think most people would agree that bilateral cellulitis is actually quite rare. Uh, and I think that it makes intuitive sense when you think about how cellulitis develops. So, um, generally, cellulitis develops uh, with a break in the skin, be it tinea uh, pedis, uh, a wound, uh, and then that allows bacterial entry that can then set up uh, infection. And the likelihood that that is going to happen in, say, both extremities at the same time 
uh, it's very, uh, very unlikely. And in the um, cases where I've been consulted in the hospital um, on um, for a diagnosis of bilateral lower extremity cellulitis, it's almost invariably a condition that looks like cellulitis but is not. Um, the most common of those being um, venous stasis dermatitis uh, associated with chronic venous stasis. And that can really look all the world like cellulitis. It can be angry uh, and red and swollen. Um, so, so flares of venous stasis dermatitis are, are common and look just like an infection. So uh, I really think that if, if your providers are seeing this, the key uh, message for them, the key thing that you need to ask them is, um, are you sure that this is uh, cellulitis and not uh, an alternative condition? And I think um, consulting dermatology in those cases can be very uh, helpful since they're certainly the ones that can um, are the best at identifying these uh, non-infectious dermatologic uh, conditions. So, so I certainly would agree that this is a, a common myth um, that uh, probably is indeed a myth and uh, I'm not sure. Thank you, Tim. Any, any comments from anybody? Questions? Well, can I add one other thing? This is very uncommon, but I think where bilateral cellulitis may be more common uh, or, or certainly feasible is in the setting of uh, cellulitis caused by water exposure. So, for example, if somebody's swimming in a lake and has, you know, bilateral wounds or portals of entry um, or um, get cellulitis from a hot tub, in that case, you could envision that you certainly could at the same time have inoculation um, of, uh, of both extremities. Um, but again, that's in the grand scheme of things is, is very uncommon. Okay. Thanks, Tim. UTIs, um, myth number one, continue to be challenged in emergency departments primarily with the demented patients being admitted with a positive UA. It's hard to convince providers not to get UAs and treat. This is huge. Um, see, next slide. Okay. All right. So this is just really hard. Um, Dementia patients are difficult to make diagnoses in, um, but they also present with an incredibly diverse range of uh, things. Um, and you know, given that the differential diagnosis of uh, a change in a dementia patient um, is long, and that asymptomatic bacteria is going to be common in this population, the, you know, the ability of a UA in culture to give you the diagnosis is super limited. Um, so, you know, my bottom line is, there's no substitute for history and physical exam. Now, the patient may not be able to give you a history, but there, there are still plenty of dementia, dementia patients who can tell you if they're having pain, right? Uh, dementia doesn't necessarily mean unresponsive, so that's number one. Um, you can ask them. Number two is that you got to press on the Superpubic area. The seeds are tender. You can press on the back. Um, you, not every patient is going to be easy um, to do a physical exam on, uh, but you're with, without something localizing you a positive UA or culture in the. You're, you're only going to have the UA in the AD. The positive positive UA is really not necessarily going to help you, and that's why we you know have championed using some sort of clinical decision support the one that we um, have prepared for this particular project with the two questions about localizing signs and symptoms and alternative explanations is, uh, is based on the common cognitive biases um, that we hold um, and has been uh, tested in, in um, a controlled circumstances um, in a couple of hospital units and long-term care units. So it's kind of a published um, uh, theoretically, I think, pretty valid um, approach, and there may be other approaches to um, helping us um, uh, with the dementia patient. Any other comments? That tends to be one, as we've been out 
making site visits. Terry, it's a John Hammer. Hi, John. Um, adding to, to that excellent explanation about uh, Ultra Mill Fest, you know, one of the things we're going to start to be seeing more and more is, especially with the new sepsis guidelines, uh, ultra metal status is one of the criteria for sepsis. And that, you know, you could easily create, create a scenario where somebody is a bit dehydrated and chronically demented, and they come in and, and bam, they have a heart rate of, a, of 100 and they're, and they're confused and nobody knows their clinical history. They, they earn the title of sepsis and they, and they get broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, just a thing to throw in there. It's, it's kind of the, the face of, of, of the way we treat dementia or ultra metal status is going to be changing uh, over time as well, and further complicating and making the picture uh, more interesting. Good point. And I think the next slide um, kind of even goes, the next question touches on that even more, but it's a great point, John, that, you know, <laughs> we're giving mixed messages. We're getting, like, throw antibiotics to the patient, um, or and hold off on antibiotics. But the fact of the matter is, even if you're worried up front in that first 24 hours about sepsis, um, you're going to do more investigation, you're going to have the patient's clinical course, and you may be able to narrow or stop antibiotics, um, depending on what you find. Um, so, so do you think that um, we have to, um, the ultimate is you still have to clinically assess the patient and act based on um, what you see, and not every sepsis in um, an older patient is UTI, right? It, it could be many other sources. Good so point. Here, and here's next. <laughs> Should I just go on, Heidi? <laughs> no, sure. Okay. Altered mental status. So altered, always in UTI, right? So, um, again, the differential diagnosis for altered mental status in frail older patient is long. UTI is potentially on the differential, but we'd like to see some localizing signs or symptoms. And the current IDSA guideline for, um, I'm sorry, the uh, NHSN um, guidance, and I think it's concur concordant with the IDSA, um, is that um, in a patient without a catheter, mental status change is not considered a criteria uh, <laughs> symptom of a UTI. Um, and you know, there was a, a study in 2014 in the Canadian Geriatric Journal that showed that there were many co common causes of altered mental status in, um, in this population, this frail older population, dehydration, med side effects, and heart failure all being um, equally as common, if not more common, than UTI. The other thing that I really want to point out here is that um, people tend to not be very um, clear what they mean by altered mental status. When I say altered mental status, I'm talking about delirium, which is a, a definition that we'll get to in a moment. When um, people talk about altered mental status in a frail older person, they're talking about like a hodgepodge of things. So restlessness, fatigue, a little confused, a little more aggressive, not being themselves, right, is a real common one. Um, and then, you know, people throw in falls in there as well, right? So those are not, um, in a study in 2011 in BMJ family practice, none of those nonspecific findings were usefully correlated to bacteria in the urine. Um, uh, so when one of the things we can encourage uh, clinicians to think about is what they mean, or be, be more precise with the definition of altered mental status. And if you could advance the slide. So um, delirium has well-established diagnostic criteria. Most of us are using the short confusion assessment method by Sharon Anui, um, which is not new. Um, but that is, there are four criteria, and you have to hit acute change with fluctuation. You have to have inattention, um, and then either a change in cognition or a change in level of consciousness. And so, you know, if you're really just, I'm a little more lethargic today, or I'm, de I'm having decreased POs, or I'm having a fall, that's not delirium. It does not meet this definition. So um, uh, that's another, um, I think, educational point uh, for clinicians. Okay. Questions or comments? <laughs>
Thank you, Heidi, and thank you, John. Okay, myth number three. Um, other non-infectious causes of abnormal UAs, elevated white blood count, nitrates, um, and leukocytes. Right, so there's a, you know, the abnormal UA is not always infection. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, things that we look at at the UA to look for infection are leukocyte asteroid, nitrate, white blood count, white blood cells, and bacteria in the urine. Right, but there is differential diagnosis. So commonly, right, in our, in our catheterized patients, they all have white cells because they have inflammation. Um, or they have asymptomatic bacteria that are colonized. Um, so, you know, generally, um, the UA is, most, is only useful if it's negative because then you're, you know, fairly certain um, that there's not too much going on. Um, however, you know, beyond this, there is a condition called sterile pyuria. It has a host of other um, uh, etiologies beyond uh, acute bacterial infection. I think I put up a table on the next slide. Um, yeah, we will have the t time to go through. But basically, um, you know, an asymptomatic patient with um, just white cells, um, there, you know, there is an extensive differential. It's not an acute issue, um, and you know, you know should be evaluated, but it could include um, infectious or inflammatory causes. Questions or comments? Okay. Yeah, what, what, real quickly, I, I agree totally with Heidi. The, uh, one way to look at it is the, the negative predictive value, meaning if the UA is normal, the likelihood of there not being, a, of a, not being an infection is very good. But the positive predictive value is, is very poor for your analysis. And that's why we prefer, and the guidelines basically leave your analysis as a diagnostic test out of, of the picture. Great point, John. Okay, last one. Um, withholding antibiotics in patients with asymptomatic bacteriuria leads to severe urosepsis and death. Okay, and we're going to wrap this up. So there is very good evidence in nearly every population that has been studied, and I'm including, you know, things like randomized controlled trials in very debilitated populations. So this includes community dwelling elderly, nursing home dwelling, frail elders, diabetics, patients with catheters, and ambulatory females, that treatment of asymptomatic bacteria doesn't improve any outcomes. Um, in fact, sometimes these patients um, are quickly colonized um, and may subsequently have more UTIs. And this is um, the guideline, there's an um, IDSA guideline that is referenced there. But um, truly, asymptomatic, except in two populations, asymptomatic bacteria um, does not need to be treated. So there are two populations for sure. One is the pregnant woman. Um, those patients... Um, do get treated for asymptomatic bacteria. Um, and the other population is a um, urologic surgery population because that population, um, you're, if you're going to be really instrumenting the lower urinary tract, you don't want to um, cause a higher off um, infection. So those are the two populations that we definitively treat. There are a couple of other t uh, types of populations that are questionable, um, such as other surgical patients that are getting prostheses um, that surgeons tend to treat. It, I'm, it, I'm not clear where the evidence is falling out on them uh, right now uh, to make a recommendation, but the, the most common populations that we see, um, that we have this question for, <laughs> um, that it's pretty, pretty clear evidence that withholding antibiotics is the right thing to do. Okay. Any questions or comments for Heidi on that one? Okay. So one last opportunity for questions specific to any of the um, myths that we discussed. Um, one last time while you guys have our experts. Okay. Hi, Terry. 
Yes. Hey, Terry, it's me. I have a question. You could have a minute. Okay. Yeah, just real quick because we're a little bit over time. Okay. So this is about um, the antibiotic general miss one about the empiric therapy. If the empiric therapy is working, don't change anything. If we have a patient with infection, very likely to be polymicrobial, but the wound caused like a um, diabetic foot, uh, diabetic foot, uh, foot ulcer, um, but the culture came back only positive for group B strep, and then the patient was started on the broad spectrum antibiotic at that time. Is it safe to de-escalate just based on the group B strep? Tim, are you still on? I am. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that really comes down to a case-by-case -case basis. But, um, but even, even in polymicrobial infections, if you have a dominant pathogen, uh, it's, often, it's often reasonable to, um, to target therapy to that specific pathogen. And particularly if you've only cultured um, group B strep, then uh, I, would, I would generally be comfortable targeting that pathogen. Um, even in, even in a diabetic foot infection. So, you know, on the other hand, if you've got a gram stain from a quality microbiological specimen that shows multiple organism types, um, yet only only one bacteria grows, in that case, you may want to leave broader uh, in spectra, broader spectrum um, therapy on board. So, it really, I think, depends on some nuances of each clinical case, but. Um, but with, with, even in settings where infections are often polymicrobial, if you have evidence uh, of a single predominant pathogen, uh, it, it's reasonable to target that pathogen. Thank you, Tim. Sure. All right, guys, since we're over time, we'll just speed through this. Um, just a reminder of our education schedule. Um, next, n next month is May, so we have our in-person meeting, and we're not going to have a webinar because we are having that in-person meeting. Um, so stay tuned for um, more offerings um, in uh, June on, and we will um, take requests for um, topics if you guys have them, so please let us know. Um, please just continue um, with your data collection, uh, quarter one 2016 are due um, by the end of June. Um, participate in our educational opportunities, and we're looking for you guys to continue to implement and sustain interventions. Um, as always, you know how to reach us, um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, thank you, guys. Enjoy the sunshine.